Welcome to the SJ Child Show, where a little bit of knowledge can turn fear into understanding. Enjoy the show. Hi, and thanks for joining the SJ Child Show. I'm your host, SJ Childs, and today I am here with Andrea. Is it, is it, I'm going to say, let you pronounce it. Is it Pola? Is it Pollock? Oh, me and the uh, sounding out of things. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my name is heard all the time. So. <laughs> My maiden name is Gulliher, so believe me, okay. it's the same sense of Bradford, easy peasy now, so that's, been, that's nice. Well, it's so nice to have you here today, and I look forward to our discussion. Um, before we get started, please just tell our audience a little bit about yourself and what brought you here today. Sure. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I, um, I was a lawyer for 19 years. And uh, my son, when he was four, he's autistic and he was not doing well in a school environment and we really couldn't find a school where we thought he would thrive. So I left my career to homeschool him and I did that for eight years. And at the end of eight years, he was ready to reenter a school environment. Um, And I knew that, you know, it would be really criminal for me to take everything I had learned with me back into a law career. So I knew I wanted to help other parents. I knew, I mean, I had learned so much through so much trial and error and that I could help parents, you know, get there faster. So I went back to school. I got my master's in education uh, and I started Autism Parent Solutions. Um, It's an education and coaching practice to help parents get there faster. Oh, I love that. So nice to have resources like that because oftentimes, especially newer parents that are, you know, um, in a diagnosis, don't even know that they have these types of resources available to them. So it's wonderful. It's what, um, kind of, what was your why or your mission to start this and like, where have you found it? It's going and all the good stuff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, great. Well, my mission was what I had learned, um, you know, I approached that homeschooling thing and the parenting thing um, like a Wall Street lawyer, which is what I had been. Um, and I really, so I, I really, um, you know, did a lot of reading and meeting experts and reaching out. And what I realized over time was that I, that there were just a few strategies that really could help parents learn to problem solve, to figure out, to get the answers that they needed, because autism is an incredibly um, complex situation, as you know, complex in every area, complex in education, complex just everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that I could um, reduce that complexity in some ways for parents to help them try to figure out what's going on and what can I do about it. Um, because, you know, so many parents were um, experiencing that uncertainty and then the guilt that comes along with the uncertainty. And I knew I could help them with that piece. Um, So I created this framework that I use to help parents um, really, you know, figure out what's going on and what to do about it. Oh, that's wonderful. What, how old was your son when he was diagnosed? Um, He was about just over two. It was like two years, four months. Um, He's 25 now. Okay. I've been at this a long time. Wow. Yeah, you have been. Absolutely. And mine is 14 and was diagnosed at 16 months. So about 10 years behind you probably (laughs) in in our journey here. And it it takes so much time. Um, I felt, I feel like for us, it was his younger years. Right now, it's almost like easy. And I don't want to say that to be like, you know, tell anybody that this is really easy, but as comparatively, Mm -hmm. comparatively to the support needs he had, especially since he was non-speaking until four or five, for those first five years, that was our most difficult, I think, and challenging 
Then we got into school that got very challenging. And the same thing, we had to come home and homeschool. And we've been homeschooling for the past six, seven, eight years now as well. And we have kind of come to a point where we're we're just not doing anything right now. Um, we're we're at a standstill, and I'm. Tr- it's tricky. I want to. I'd like to know what you think about resources for mid teens, fourteen to eighteen. How do you think, uh, as far as like, especially not having a child in school, how do we provide these? resources, opportunities, and experiences for those kiddos who don't get services at those ages and have this gap in uh, services and, like for us, school, (laughs) a school environment. Right. Well, I mean, I think it's two different, slightly different things, right? The services issue, I mean, I'm curious what you mean by we're not doing anything. Do you mean on the the services and therapy front? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. We just, after COVID, we didn't reinvent. <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't have a uh, reinstate ABA or have them come back out. And we've just thought we're, you know, this has been, um, he's, he seems to be progressing. He's really yeah. progressing in his own way mm-hmm. on his own kind of time frame, And we're following that. Great. Yeah. No. And, and that's why I think it's different. Cause I, I love that because, you know, not everybody needs services just because they have autism. I mean, Everybody needs support in lots of places. I don't mean to discount the struggles and the the needs for support, but I love that you're recognizing that he's doing well. He's making the progress. He doesn't need that kind of support. So to me, the other thing you're asking about then is more like social support because he's not in school. And so opportunities. So to me, that's a slightly different thing. And I think there it's, it can be challenging, but finding people who like the same things that he likes is the best opportunity for creating friendships and bonds because it just gives a natural, um, you know, a natural path toward connection. Yeah. And so tricky with, um, with autism in general, the connection piece is so very different for each person. Um, I know, and, and, you probably don't know this about me or, or my family, but I was diagnosed at 45. So late diagnosed. Um, now I'm able to kind of look at that as a whole, as a, a human and go back and kind of piece together all of the pieces that that meant for me. My daughter um, is also, she's in sixth grade. She was also diagnosed um, at eight. And so as with girls, very late, you know, a later diagnosis and, and understanding Um, But then when I look at his communication piece, I still see that even if I found another child or somebody with his same interest, I don't know that that would be important or meaningful to him. I don't know that those skills are ones that he wants to have or cares to have. He seems to me kind of still... um, in his own world still. And there hasn't been a lot of, and I know there's a lot of autism stories like that, right? Where they just, they're hard to reach. Um, But, you know, we we're so glad that he is communicative at this point. Like, and, and I kind of refer to him as semi-verbal because he's not, uh, it's, it wouldn't be easy for him to access like, well, excuse me. (laughs) help in the community or anything like that. Um, he still doesn't have those skills available to him. So mm-hmm. definitely things that we'll need to be working on. Yeah. And I hear you. What I would suggest though, to think about is um, I agree with your initial statement a lot that the connection looks different yeah. for each person. And just because he can't necessarily create reciprocal um, conversation or it does, it may not look like he has the connection doesn't mean that there isn't some connection there. So, you know, I guess it may be true that, you know, you know him best, obviously, and he can articulate some, some ability, you know, something about his preferences. But um, I think the best shot at connection, I would go back to that is somebody who has similar interests and the connection might not look like what we think connection looks Mm. like, but he may, he may experience it even if he can't show that. So that just might be something that to keep in mind. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Cause I think that 
oftentimes we get a little bit stagnant in our own, you know, parenting and things when we're like, oh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And we kind of give up mm-hmm. on the ideas that maybe it will in different um environments maybe or you know with different individuals that it might work a little better so right well also then to I I guess I'm asking to reframe and rethink about what does it look like to work right so Mm -hmm. for my son for example at that age you know if he were in it in a um, place where there was say a sporting event going on he would not want to join it he wouldn't even look like he was looking at it but he really wanted to go like every time like he felt connected. He felt, and little by little, he eased his way in. Like here he'd walk over and he'd like shoulder bump somebody. Like for him, that was connection. Yeah. So, you know, just keeping an open mind to what working looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. And I think being an, a parent of autistic children, that is like your daily goal is to keep an open mind. <laughs> Even if they consider what you hadn't considered, think, and, you know, I think that it's for society, I, I think that parents before that maybe didn't have the understanding to think outside the box, that was something that is, is really hard for, for those who are still in that mindset Um, For those of us who have kind of been forced and pushed into that, open your mind, you're not going to be able to do this otherwise. Uh, We see the benefit and we see the, you know, the outcome that can be successful for so many families and so many children and adults now um, that it's so nice to that to have things like love on the spectrum to come out to media kind of showing the, um, complexity, like you said, of so many different levels of, of autism that obviously can't be represented in one hour of a TV show. So uh, it's nice though, that they're starting to, to kind of, you know, hit the iceberg, right? <laughs> and shine a light on the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And you know, that whole, what you were talking about, you know, the idea of keeping an open mind and reassessing and remembering to, um, you know, challenge yourself to think of things in new ways is exactly why I love what I do, because that's what I help parents do all the time, because we don't realize it's, it's, it's impossible to see your own blind spots, yeah. right? So it is, you know, so helpful to have somebody who, you know, and it's, it's not, a, it's not about calling someone out on their blind spots at all. It's about opening up you know, have you considered this other idea? And sometimes the answer is yes, I've considered it and rejected it. Great. Next, let's move on to yeah. the next. Idea. <laughs> yeah. And you, that's wonderful that you said that too, because it's not a one size fits all jar of cookies. Like not everything is going to work. Your kid is not going to react or fit in the same way or, you know, take a medicine that's going to react the same way. Everybody is so very different. And so, it's really this trial and error almost and uh, measured tracking. <laughs> That's what we did when he was younger. I remember just tracking, tracking, tracking everything to to try to make sense of things. And what types of, um, when you have a new parent that comes to you and says, okay, where do I start? Like what what is my top three things that I need to start focusing on to help build this connection and relationship? Yeah, well, I, mean, I love that question, actually, to build the connection and relationship, because that is where I focus, right? Sometimes parents are like, which therapy should I do first? And I, mm-hmm. you know, I can give opinions on those kinds of things, but I'm talking about parenting and parenting is separate from, you know, all of those therapies. So I am focusing on the relationship and communication. Um, to me, the place to start is really understanding self-regulation, theirs and yours, right? Because we don't get taught about self-regulation. We Self-regulation is a set of skills that we develop somewhat naturally over time, but it, it's actually a set of skills and we don't realize all the time when we're exercising it or not exercising it, right? So we're always modeling and we have opportunities to help our children grow their self-regulation. So we start there and then the next step is really learning how to set your child up for success. And what I mean by that is really... Um, setting expectations that are at or just above where they are so that they're successful. It doesn't mean lowering expectations in the long run because 
having high expectations is great, but having a high expectation that they can't meet is just frustrating for everyone. Mm-hmm. So learning how to meet them where they are, which I know is an overused phrase, but it actually really, to me, does describe what we need to do. And then, and then help them to reach just the next step, right? And that's how we get to the high expectations, right? Step by step. We can't skip all those steps. Exactly. I remember our one of our early intervention um, therapists, one of the things that I think advice she gave us or a a tangible kind of game to play, if you will, with him was ready, set, go. We would say ready, set, go. And we'd run down the hallway or we'd give high fives or something. And and so we do that with him all the time. And, you know, at the very beginning, there was no inner, he wouldn't, he, there wasn't anything. And then he started to keep seeing it happening and it would, we were so excited that he would get so excited. And, you know, eventually he was the one yelling go or high five or, you know, and, and kind of finishing the phrase with us. Um, and he was really little, like, I think four, four and a half is when he, um, started to speak. So it was about four and a half or five when that kind of all took place. And it was like magic for us. So, you know, we finally were like, Oh, he's paying you. He's, he's with us. He's in this with us. It's not just us, you know, him grabbing our hands to open a bag of chips or grabbing our hands to get the refrigerator for water, grab, you know, taking us to this place, taking us to that place. Um, it was him really saying ready, set, go and doing this like exciting little tiny thing with us. So I think that's a really great, just tangible idea for parents to take that little tiny game and, you know, to, yeah. to start doing that. Yeah. Um, but I, can I go back? I just want to add yeah, one quick thing, please. which is my overarching message. Those are, I, I gave you some sort of specific places we start, which are, those are still overarching as well, but um, is really to think about prioritizing support over discipline and punishment because, you know, traditional parenting techniques tend to steer toward discipline, right? We, you know, we try to correct the mistakes and support feels so much better all the way around. And it's so much more effective because support is about teaching them the skills that they're lacking that is preventing them from, you know, being successful in the moment versus punishment, which is making them feel bad, but it doesn't necessarily teach them the skill that was lacking in the first place. So that I would say is a big overarching message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that was a really great lesson to take into the next child parenting for us <laughs> when we kind of realize and we. I have an older daughter that's twenty four, uh, stepdaughter, and so in our middle, you know, child, he was. It was a whole new ball game. We had parented her and raised her completely different. Um, but we realized right away that uh, this wasn't, like you said, the punishments or consequences for a two-year-old that wasn't even making eye contact or noises or anything like that wasn't going to be the way we should go. Um, and it, it does take, I, I think, a, a few weeks, months even, to really renegotiate yourself, to renegotiate, okay, Instead of jumping to this conclusion where I'm going to yell at my child, get back here, do whatever, I need to figure out some new ways to communicate with my child. Yeah. Um, And one of the struggles parents have sometimes with that is um, they don't know what to do. Like, even if they know that the the punishment's not working or the yelling to come here, they don't know what to do. And then, so it it tends to be one extreme or the other, either punishment or letting everything go. And neither of those is effective at teaching the skills, right? So Um, true. And then also, then they worry, am I being permissive? So then they swing all the way back to being strict. So, and I get it because, you know, we're not being taught what to do, right? We just are, we know what isn't working or we're taught like one technique for one moment Hmm. But we're not, it's very hard to generalize those, which is what I try to help parents do. Absolutely. What type of um, regulating do you 
tell parents to, well, I guess everybody has their own types, but there, are there any specific um, exercises like, and, and mental exercises rather, not physical, that you suggest for parents to yep. start that process? Yeah. Um, well, there are two um, that I, that I find effective for a lot of parents. Um, the first is just really interrupting the impulse, really recognizing it, the impulse to yell, for example, or get angry or because it feels like it's happening to you. But once you realize that it's just a habit, like any other habit that feels like automatic, because that's what habits are, right? Things we do automatically without thinking about them. Once you, you know, put it into the category of a habit and you just, you know, create the intention to interrupt it when it happens, you know, in the beginning, sometimes you don't interrupt it until you're already in the process of it. But over time, you realize, hold on, I can take a moment, right? Sometimes it's a breath, sometimes whatever, it, you know, that people do have their own ways of, you know, collecting themselves. Um, but the interruption piece is the piece um, that, that helps them, you know, change from one place to the other. And then the second is to support that, you know, this, the breathing, all the things that we know to do, but having a mantra that reminds you that your child's doing the best that they can in this moment, or he's not doing this on purpose to frustrate me. He's doing it yeah. uh, because it's the best he can do in the moment. Whatever the mantra is that works for you, um, that can help in that moment. Like interruption plus mantra can help bring you back to regulation. I love that. I, I think I I did that with our <laughs> the little one taught myself not how to how to not yell anymore by challenging myself just the way you said interrupting that habit. By telling myself, every time you want to yell, you have to yell, I want to yell right now. And it started to sound pretty ridiculous <laughs> when I would yell out, I want to yell right now. You know, and so it was, um, it was practice, but it, man, I, it's been like 10 years now that that's been the way it is. And I have a hard time remembering <laughs> what that was like to be that kind of parent. And sometimes I, you know, I find myself like, oh, why can't I just like yell something? And now I just have no. <laughs> well, look, we can't. We're human. We're gonna do things sometimes that we <laughs> wish we had done better. Like that's okay. That's another piece of it. It's like really showing compassion for yourself because we are human and we're busy humaning, and you know, so that that's gonna happen too. But at the same time, we also want to remember, you know, we're expecting our children to regulate, right? When they're having a hard time, it's usually the source of it is a self regulation issue, right? So we're asking them to self-regulate these children. And as adults, we're saying, I can't, I can't self-regulate. It's happening to me. And I understand, I do, I have compassion for that feeling as well. And there are tools that we can use to, uh, to change that habit and that pattern. Yeah. I, I love the, we, we do the deep breathing and that's kind of what we started modeling for DJ when he was really little was deep breathing and taking those deep breaths, trying to help him. And I remember one time coming down and hearing him kind of have a little freak out coming down and then seeing him take some deep breaths on his own. And I was so happy that he had, you know, we'd done it for so many years that he was finally practicing that on his own. And those are the types of successes that parents need to know about, that it doesn't happen at the very first time. It doesn't happen the third, fourth, fifth time. But maybe the 37th time, you know, yeah. you get to this practice and then, wow, now he knows in his own body that this is something that can help me, can help me yeah. and he can start practicing it more. Yeah. I love that lesson because yeah. I do think sometimes parents give up on things and decide they don't work. Again, I get it. I was there. I was that parent. Um, but you know, you don't want to give up when you're, you know, three feet from gold, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. um, so really having people who like, like you who have experienced it, be able to share with parents like, yeah, I know, I know it feels like it's not working. Just stay with it. Don't give up. Exactly. It's really tricky. Um, I find that a lot with um, we did diet changes early on with our child that made a huge difference for us. And it, I think that that is something that, and of course, that's not the subject of this um, podcast, but, but I think that that's something also that's really hard for parents is that they don't stick with it long enough. And so they don't see those benefits happen. Um, and 
we've now been, you know, 12 years into this and we know, we know for a fact the, the benefits and we see the cause, we see the effect when things go differently, when things happen right. out of sorts. And then we say, oh gosh, <laughs> yeah. he must have gotten into that cookie or, you yeah. know, with gluten in it and not but, in his own cookies or something. Yeah, so. this is such a great example though of the complexity because yeah. on the one hand, we're saying stay with it because maybe we haven't tried it long enough. On the other hand, sometimes we um, put our children into some kinds of therapies and things where the professional is saying, just stay with it. And you're looking at it, you're saying, that's not working. That doesn't yeah. feel good. And so it, you know, it, it is complex because then we're saying, oh, well, don't stick with that if it doesn't feel good. Right. Yeah. So it's really hard for parents. And I, you know, I, uh, I, I remember that. And I, it is again, what I try to help parents with really developing the inner confidence to know that they're making the best choice that's available in the moment and they're not going to be perfect and that's okay. But growing that confidence to feel like, yeah, I got this. I I'm making the best choice that anyone in my shoes could make right now. Exactly. And it's really, it's really hard and it feels so isolating and, so I think what you're doing is so important and so um, wonderful for parents to feel like they can have someone to relate with, feel like they can have someone to count on. So I think that oftentimes we get into situations where it's like we don't see the end. We don't see an option to get out of these emotional situations at the moment. Um, and so it's it's so nice to have steps to take someone to talk to at the moment where they can just bring you down or, or whatever that might, might be the case. How do you, um, how do your clients reach out to you or, or something, if that something like that happens, what does that look like? Um, well, I have a program that's a group program, um, which has a, a number of different components. It has an educational component. So I teach them a lot of the strategies in a really direct accessible way um, so that they don't have to read 300 books and all of that stuff really, you know, condenses the information for them. Um, and then, but we meet twice weekly in a small group. And what I love about the group experiences, it really does accelerate the learning because sometimes parents ask questions that you didn't know you had, right? But also every time we answer questions, we're generalizing the learning so that everyone can apply it. And that's how we develop you know, the, the problem solving muscles to, you know, to know, like I said in the beginning, what's the issue and what do I do about it? Um, I do also have one-to-one -one opportunities to speak directly with parents. Um, but I, I love the, the group format because um, it's also, it's a bonding, like you said, it's very isolating yeah. and the parents get to know each other. And it's funny after they've graduated, I can see them interacting on Facebook and stuff. And it's just nice. I love that. Yeah. Isn't that be a beautiful feeling too, to know that you've um, kind of brought and connected these people with people that they really have needed and can help their whole family. Um, Absolutely. Because I think if one family member is getting more support than ever before, they will help the rest of their family feel that, you know, and, and be able to join in on that. And I, yeah. I, I've found in our community building, it's been just the same that, you know, we started with, let's build um, a group just for our neighbors to be a part of. And now it's worldwide and there's like 1600 members and it was just for these four people in this neighborhood. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's like, wow, yeah. wow, wow. Yeah. And, you know, people, I love it. And it just yeah. it makes my heart so happy to know that not only do like you do probably in your groups, it's always a safe space. It's always a protected space that we will, you know, if somebody doesn't understand something or somebody says something that somebody else gets upset about, we take it as a teaching experience and say, Hey, let's talk about, you know, the puzzle piece. <laughs> let's talk about the whatever pieces of here and there. Um, because it's just, there's so much. Um, I think that if you're brand new into uh, like, and like I said, you're 10 years ahead of mine. So I can't imagine how much you've seen change yes. over time and, and kind of the, 
the important parts sometimes are fuzzied up with stuff that's unimportant, like logos and things that that aren't representative really of a person and the care that they need and the support that they need. And I see this. Do you do you also see kind of the struggle in the autistic community between the older autistics that are they're coming and saying, no, this was bad, this was bad, this is, you know, and and then kind of the change that's happening right now. We're, we don't want the bad stuff. We're trying to change it all, right? They're trying to to make it all above board. What do you see in that? And since you've been in it a, longer than than me even, how do you see that change happening and kind of the importance of it? Well, I mean, I, I've seen so much change in the last 20 years. And, yeah. you know, one example of what you're talking about is, you know, when my son was first diagnosed, um, it, everybody would correct. If you said your child was autistic, they correct. No, he has autism. It's not, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't define his identity. And that has, you know, shifted now. And autistic people are saying, no, it is my identity. I am an autistic person. I don't have autism. Right. So that's such a great example of that change over the last 20 years. Um, but I think it is so important to listen to the perspectives of autistic people who can share with us what their experiences have been. Um, I do think it's also important to, that's why it's so important for you to develop your own confidence um, as a parent, because it's so important for you to put it through your filter first, right? Because there are so many people who are different. So you can't listen to one autistic person and their experience and then conclude that therefore the whole system is bad because that person had a bad experience, right? So it's, it is about really taking in, really respecting those perspectives and developing your own, you know, understanding, especially about your child, right? It does, it starts with the understanding. And I think, you know, we tend to often, and it, the professionals out there tell us, do this, sign up for that, you know, this therapy, that thing. So we focus on that first when the first piece has to be about understanding the child and how our children fit into those models. And I think that's changed a lot too, because you know, and a lot of people knew nothing. So we were very vulnerable to whatever anybody told us because we didn't know. And there wasn't a lot of access to information about it. Absolutely. No, I think that it's so much is available now, yet we're still just learning. <laughs> and it's, it seems to be, um, you know, every week there's new information or new um, ways we can be supportive or offer support or don't say this or, you know, be careful when you say that. So I, I do think that there, especially for people who have platforms and have the, you know, the um, ability to bring the conversation to a wider audience Language is so very important that I need to make sure that I'm always <laughs> trying to say, you know, what's best, what's relevant, what is um, acceptable. But I also think that, like you said, it's also based off our own experiences so many times. And um, when we are speaking based on our own experiences, others might not feel that that's relatable. They might feel like, well, that's not happening for me. You know, my, my kiddo is completely nonverbal or uses an AAC device or, you know, has all these other, um, skills necessary or, you know, and it, it's like you said, I think that looking at through your own filter, that's a really wonderful advice because one size doesn't fit all. And um, especially in autism and there's a hundred, I think my son told me this the other day. He's, he's my mathematician. There's 183 <laughs> million autistics in the world today, um, which is, I think, I think he said is like one in 33 or it's, it's close to that or mm -hmm. something. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, once we start realizing that that's 183 million different types of stories, that's like, that's who can really like, who's reading that many stories. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have to give, give grace and understanding to that. 
I, and it also right there shows the complexity of all the different types of, of personalities and skills and everything that, that comes with it. So absolutely. And what I would add though, is that I, I totally agree. It's 183 million different stories, but I would encourage parents <clears throat> to look for similarities to yeah. what you're hearing, what you're looking at rather than differences, because I do, you know, I talk to a lot of parents who are like, oh, but my child is different. That will never work for my child. And I understand that again, when my child was growing up, he was different. It would never, I, I so I'm not saying I don't understand where that comes from. I a hundred percent do, but is it useful in, in you learning to, you know, get the support and understanding that you need to help your child? It's not, if we're always saying like, that won't work, that won't work because my child's different. It's not going to help you um, get the <clears throat> the tools that you need. So try to keep an open mind, right? Back to that conversation, mm -hmm. right? Um, to the things that might be the same, that might be close, things that we might be able to generalize, um, that you might be able to generalize to your own child. I love that. I think that that's so true. And um, over the last couple of years, I've been hosting autism events where I invite autistics to come and share their stories. And the amount of people who reach out and say, yes, you know, this was something put me in touch with this person because that was like the journey that, that I've been on or the, you know, how do I reach that type of a therapy and how do I get into play therapy, for example, and, you know, floor time, there's so many different new um, opportunities that are available out there for people. And so I love that you said that it is best to find somebody that you can relate to. Um, and even in a tiered process, you know, find someone like yourself who's been in the game 10 years longer, find somebody on your same level, and then find somebody who's brand new starting out who you can mentor. And then there's this tiered process of mentorship going on where Andrea, I need help. You know, <laughs> he's 14. What's happening right now? Right. Kind of a thing. You've been there. You've done that. Help me out. So I think that it's, it's so important for us as parents to find relatable people. And I'm so lucky that I got this to meet all of these people, to gather all of these information and opinions. Luckier than most moms probably out there that don't have this available to them um, because it's such a source for me to gather information. And like you said, try things, try new things, and maybe take out some things that uh, it isn't working or people say, no, that didn't work for us. And okay, well, <laughs> we'll stop trying so hard. <laughs> Or try something that maybe you tried before that didn't work because your child's different now. Like I, <clears throat> I guess I'm just also encouraging people, like if you find yourself saying, no, 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 that won't work because of this, like catch yourself yeah. and say, okay, hold on, time out. <laughs> maybe I can, you know, yeah, try something that feels like it might be close, even if I'm not sure. And then also believing something might help is so useful also. Like stay open-minded to believing it could. Because when you decide something's not going to work, you're right. Yeah. And, you know, I was just, a memory popped into my mind of <clears throat> my husband and I sitting down and doing like a brainstorming with like the bubble. And you put the idea in the middle and then the little arms off and you put the little ideas out. <clears throat> and there's often times where we find a lot of um, strength or, you know, yes, we can try that. That's something new we can do. And we, we can go back and see things that we have tried and didn't work. Or like you said, now that he's a totally different person now than he was when he was six or seven. Um, and he's so much more independent and capable of so much more now. And so, yeah, maybe we need to go back and revisit some of those fun ideas to see what might work now that he, you know, would like to, and, and trying to keep it in line with the interests. I love that because that will help your child stay motivated um, when you find their interests and things like that. Is yeah. there and, and keeping it in line with, you know, what they're able to do right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you find something that is in alignment with their interests, but it's just too far above mm -hmm. their skill level at that moment or social, whatever it is. And that doesn't mean it's a failure. It just means we have to look at um, the parts that work, focus on those and build up to uh, 
you know, to the complete picture. Absolutely. Oh, I, there's so much to still learn so much to, you know, be done (laughs) so much work to, to watch, um, others that will come, you know, uh, after us to, to lead this charge and keep moving forward with all of the, um, parenting coaching and therapies and, uh, education for, for so much legislation. We need so much education for all of these things. Um, what is maybe before we go kind of a a takeaway for parents that they can say, okay, this is the one thing I'm going to try today. Um, I, I think the, the single most important thing, which I did mention, but is catch yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're trying to use discipline and punishment, catch yourself yeah. and say, is this helping my child build the skill to make a different choice? And what I mean by that also is, so sometimes a child will do something and a parent will discipline because they're like, I know he can do that. He did it before. Maybe. But what was stopping that child from doing it in the moment, right? Usually a child's, um, you know, unwanted behavior, let's call it, it's stemming from an inability to make a better decision in the moment, right? So we, if we start with a compassion, what support is my child needing instead of what punishment can I give to make him do better? I, to me, that would be the single thing. Just catch yourself and be nice to yourself because you're going to yell. That's okay. If, if that's your habit and, but then say, oh wait, hold on. Let me reflect on that situation. What could I do differently next time? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I think that it's, important for every parent out there to know that whatever part of parenting you're in, as long as you're doing it with meaningful intention and and looking out for number one, yourself, because you're not going to be a good parent if you're not looking out for yourself first, and then looking out for your child, just like on the airplane, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, right? And then your child, um, and really staying, um, focused in your intentions of parenting. I think that that's an important piece to, to remind everyone. It's been so wonderful to have you here today, Andrea. I'm, I hope that we can get together and have some off camera discussions and <laughs> talk about. I would some, love you know, that. Let's do that for too. sure. Sounds like we have a lot to, to go over and, and ideas we could, you know, collaborate with. I love that. Where um, can everyone go to find out more about you, to support you on social media, What where all the good places are? Okay, great. Thank you for asking. So my, my website is autismparentsolutions.com. Um, and there are a variety of resources there and information about me and my program. Um, I have a Facebook group that's Autism Parent Solutions Community, which I would love to have you join. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and those are the main ones. If you think parent coaching is for me, I want to do this. You can reach out to me directly um, by email, um, Andrea at autismparentsolutions.com. All right. That's right. A, see a theme here. Right up there. <laughs> um, yeah. So we can, you know, we can talk over email and then put a, a call on the calendar if we think it's going to, you know, be a good fit for both of us. So Fantastic. those would be Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing. And um, yeah, I hope that everybody goes and and there are a lot of um, groups and communities. So if you have a chance to join them, please do. They make so much of a difference to yourself, your family, and to the other community members who you might be able, you know, to share with and, and to have that relatability. So wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah.